voice of this house, Pastor Jimmy. To his explosive, beautiful model sister. I think you got more shouts than your brother. To some of the most incredible people I've ever had the occasion to be with, and that's Tommy and Brenda Todd. You know, a lot of people don't they don't have any idea of what it actually takes to be in ministry so long and the things that you push through all these years. And for many of you that may not have seen them or known of them before, you are in the presence of, of absolute royalty, magnificence in ministry. Thank you for coming. And of course, the Miles family, Dr. Francis Miles and Camilla. Thank you for coming to God's country, Nigeria. God spends his days in Nigeria, but he sleeps in Zimbabwe. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together, Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. Let's go. Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive us as he has us. The original version says forever, amen. We added forever and ever to convince ourselves. <laughs> Tell three people you love them, you may be seated. Uh, in starting this message this morning, uh, for leadership, I kind of like I'm working with a little bit of the leading of the Spirit, and I'm going to preach, maybe teach, but more preach on the subject. It's a power play. Power play. I'm in Daniel 3, verse 1, verse 4 to 6. Verse 12 to 14, verse 16 to 17, verse 26 and verse 28. We'll rehearse those as we come to them. Daniel chapter number 3. This is after Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and Daniel gives the interpretation of the vision. In Daniel chapter number 1, verse 20 and 21, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were given 
great gifts, but Daniel had a superior gift of visions and interpreting dreams. And so, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 90 feet tall and 30 feet wide. And he set it in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse 4, Then a herald cried aloud and said, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the seven instruments, one for each day of the week, one for each dimension of the heavens, the cornet, flute, harp, sackpot, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whosoever does not worship shall in that same hour be cast into the midst of a fiery, a burning fiery furnace. Verse 12. There are certain Jews, they said Nebuchadnezzar, that have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded you. They serve not your gods. They don't worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage, in his rage, in his rage, and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and said to these men, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful in answering you in this matter. In other words, there's no need for PC, political correctness. No need for that. Straight to the matter. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So what they were saying is that God is able to take us out of the fire, but we will still be in your hand, and you can throw us in water, throw us to crocodiles, put swords or spears through us, but we want to be we want you to be aware, not only are we coming out of the fire, we are coming out of your hand, your influence. And then he goes, they go on to say, uh, then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 28, spoke and said, after they had come out of the fire, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel to deliver his servant that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not 
uh, serve nor worship any God except their own. Father, help me for these few minutes, 50 minutes from now. Matthew chapter number 6, verse 31. Matthew has three major discourses. The first one is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It is here that Jesus is introducing the kingdom of God as opposed to a kingdom or a nation led by aristocracy which were priests, uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, culminating in a Sanhedrin governing body. And so John the Baptist becomes his forerunner as Aaron was Moses' forerunner. 7-1 of Genesis says, Behold, I have made you a god before Pharaoh, and Aaron shall be your prophet. So John Baptist was the prophet before Jesus. Jesus became the message bearer to the devil, let my people go. And so Jesus, in introducing the concept of the kingdom of heaven, took three whole chapters written by Matthew, a mathematician slash calculator, a calculative individual, tax collector, who synchronized his book in a manner, mathematically, scientifically, and also by faith, for individuals, the Jews in particular, to understand the era and the ushering in of a kingdom whose king was now made manifest in flesh, Jesus the Christ, signified by the fact that stars came and stood over Bethlehem, the prediction from Micah where he would be born. And kings, wise men, came from the east, yielding kingly gifts, myrrh, for the pain he would suffer of carrying human sin as a sinless being. Frankincense, to bring a fragrance to deal with the stench of human misconduct and human putrid behavior, and gold to finance his three and a half year ministry. When they left, Herod killed the babies, which became a horrendous sacrifice. And so in the three discourses, Matthew 13, the second discourse, Jesus tells seven parables. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. Starts with a sower, because everything starts in seed form, and ends with a huge net that catches all kinds of fish and the nets began to break. And so if you start anything in life, it must start with the seed that must be planted. A seed that is not planted abides alone and will die. So everything you start starts in seed form. The seed has a way of metastasizing, evolving, and moving in a cataclysmic way through metamorphic process from a seed, like a, a, a sea, um, an egg, 
on a leaf to a caterpillar to a cocoon to something that it doesn't look like in its original form, a, a, an egg or a caterpillar. So when Jesus starts his discourse, he's telling them in 13, there are seven stages in which the kingdom is going to be released. He reiterates these stages in Matthew 24 and 25, which is his last discourse. The first discourse is the courtyard. The second one is the holy place. Matthew 25 and 26 is the holiest of holies. And it's in there that he begins to reveal his deity over and above his humanity. And it is in this discourse where he explains the end time and the signs of his departure and his return. And so in the first discourse, Matthew 6, verse 31, Jesus says, therefore, because of what just told you, don't take any thought saying, what shall we eat? Don't take any thought on what we shall drink. Don't take any thought on what we're going to wear. For these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows exactly that you need all these things. Everyone say, I need things. I need things. Say, I need things. I need things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. If there's a kingdom, there's a king. Seek first the king and his agenda. And all these things shall be not multiplied, shall be unto you. So, a lot of people, Pastor Jimmy, ask God for multiplication. In my view, that's the wrong thing to do. Simply because one plus one is I need to come and teach school in Nigeria. One plus one is two plus two is four plus four is eight plus eight is sixteen plus sixteen is thirty two plus thirty two is sixty four plus sixty four. Right. Now that's addition. Let's go to multiplication. One multiplied by zero is? Zero. Ten multiplied by zero is? Zero. One million multiplied by zero is? Zero. So before you go to multiplication, you have to add to your life character. <laughs> Seeds sown, because God cannot multiply nothing and give you something. So Abraham, God was adding to his life. And as God added to his life, he then transferred him from addition to multiplication and said, because you have not withheld what I've added to your life, Isaac, you now qualify for multiplication. That in multiplying, I will multiply you, and in blessing, I will bless you. Say three times, God add to my life. God add to my life. 
the women are more efficient in the service. Where are the brothers? You all sound like Manchester United supporters. <laughs> and so, and, and so we need, I'm going somewhere, God to continue to add value. See, when you join this church, you came for whatever reason, many broken hurt, you came and found music, etc., etc. a very expensive screen that I'm still trying to figure out how I can steal. Um, and so after about six months a year, when you've been added to the church, you've gone through new membership classes, etc. now suddenly you have an opinion. You want to change the church. You don't like the songs. You don't like the color. You don't like the way they dress. You don't like the color of the pulpit. Well, there's 10,000 million churches in Lagos from the size of the speaker to the size of campground at a Buya's place. Choose one. There are thousands of people in this church but one apostle that has to make the final decision. That's half of you. What about the other half? We can't sing all your songs. It's, there's no time. We can't preach all your messages. We can't have every service dealing with marriages and people who don't have the sense to love their wives and respect their husbands. We don't have the time to teach children's ministry and youth and all of that. And so we do our very best as African leaders to teach Jesus Christ with an addition of prosperity so that the quality of life of Africans can improve so that children in northern Nigeria can at least get a shot at going to school so that more universities can be built in this incredible country instead of our kids lining up for hours and hours getting visas, paying huge money for visas that they may never get to a school that would never really appreciate who they are. And so what I'm saying here is that when we're dealing with local issues, We've got to deal with the bread and butter issues concerning life. And so if we'll seek first the kingdom of God, things find their way in your life. Faith is the substance of Faith is the substance of so God wants you to have things. So when you don't have things, you have hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So when things manifest, there's no need for hope. What replaces hope and faith is management. I'm hoping for a Mercedes Benz. I have faith for a Mercedes Benz. Now that my hope and my faith have produced the Mercedes Benz, my responsibility is to manage the vehicle, manage the building, manage the house, Manage your marriage. Manage the camera. Camera guys, don't drop those. Those are thousands of dollars. Manage the sound system. Manage the drums. Don't break drumsticks every time you play. Manage the keyboards. Manage the chairs. Manage the parking lot. Manage the country. 
manage the Naira. And so, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, Teal Ivy wrote a phenomenal four-line poem. Behind you, all your memories. Before you, all your dreams. Around you, all who love you. With in you all you need. That's great. It's all in you. When God puts you together, everything you ever need, Bartimaeus, is in you. All you need is the right connection to unlock what is in you. I prophesy to a hundred people today by the time you hit the 1st of May, you are going to meet someone in the most unlikely place that's going to unlock what is within you. And when that unlocking comes in your life, a power play begins. Give someone a high five and say, get ready for a power play. Oh, it's going to get good in a minute. I wrote the statement in a moment of inspiration. Power is an enigmatic entity whose range is from ultimate power, which is God, to invisible power, which are microscopic beings, each of them possessing power in their own right. Power cannot be fully understood or comprehended, nor can power be fully grasped, but its varying levels in which it exists can be calculated mathematically, scientifically, in comparison to its varying entities. This microphone has no power without an amp. That amp has no power without electricity. So each entity cohabits with another, empowering each other for edification of the whole. You've got to say amen. The chair you are sitting didn't come by itself. It came as a tree that someone cut down illegally. Oh, legally. <laughs> the material came from a plant that somebody picked and wove into cotton or wool. A skillsman put them together. A person in aesthetics arrange them in order. The lines are straight, because if they wouldn't, it would irritate the fire out of me. The same with the lights, the same with everything. The participants that put this phenomenal edifice together are many, each one complementing the other. The roof didn't start first. The roof was put on last. So seek first, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, seek first things first. Then things will be added to you. Is everybody with me so far? And in your seeking, seek the power that the entity holds. The other day, I couldn't watch my Liverpool game. And the reason for that, the television didn't come on. The reason the television didn't come on had nothing to do with electricity. 
even though we have so many power cuts or load shedding. The problem was a small 13 amp fuse. A small thing like that caused us to have a draw with Manchester United. A 13 amp fuse was as powerful as the hydroelectric power station that was generating 350,000 kilowatts. The fuse needed permission to transmit a handful of volts to a television. Everything is interconnected and everything is involved in a power play. Tell three good looking women and say, baby, you in a power play. Yeah, baby, you in a power play. Yeah, you in a power play. You, you may not realize it right now, but you are in a power play. And at some point in your life, Matthew, you could be counting taxes and taking money from people. But one day a man's going to come to you and say, follow me and I'm going to make something out of your life. You could be in a tree because you are short in stature, but small in character. An upper tree to look down upon a, a, a powerful creator who will look up to you the only time in your life because of the corporate ladder you have created. And he's going to tell you, come down from your high horse and stand on the ground and I'll show you how small you really are. Because what you have built in your life in terms of a power play is so small in terms of the big picture. And so some people have made themselves higher than they ought to be. You need to come down to size so God can put you in the rung of a true power play. 300 women, clap your hands while I find a breath. Shout three times, it's a power play. And so Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 10, he had said, I ask the Lord to remove a thorn in the flesh. The reason he had a thorn in the flesh was because he said, lest I be exalted above measure. The word measure there is based on Moses all the way to Isaiah, Jerry, Zeke, and all the other prophets, the ones preceding him. He said, my combined revelation concerning the church and Jesus Christ. If you want to know anything about the church, you have to read the 14 Pauline apostles. He tells you everything you know about the church. Jesus came and spoke eloquently and efficiently, but he never left a book. We have a record where he sang a song. We don't even know if he sang in tune. He never even left a lyric. He left nothing. He just told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you get power from on high and didn't even imply that when you get that power, part of the power is going to write books. Didn't tell them that. But here comes Paul and begins to write significant books and we are what we are in terms of liturgy, ritual, church, order, rank, file, fivefold ministry, deacons, elders, grace, yada, 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 
all according to Paul. And so Paul says, I was given an opportunity for an abundance above measure of revelation knowledge. And then he says in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore, I was given a thorn in the flesh. Now I take pleasure in my infirmity. I take pleasure in my reproaches. I take pleasure in my necessities, in my persecutions, in my distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. In other words, in my power play, revelation knowledge will actually give me a level of awe and aura, especially when I'm addressing the Athenians in chapter number 17 of Acts. He said, but now, with my weakness in my flesh, and I realize I am weak, I now have to depend on the revelator in chief, my Lord Jesus Christ, who has given me grace, which is above power. Grace is above power. Say that. Say it with passion. And so with grace, you are then able to be a problem solver. Wisdom is the principal thing, but wisdom doesn't solve all problems. Grace replaces the ability to solve problems. So you have a woman caught in the act of adultery. They throw her before Jesus. They don't bring the men that were responsible in her enterprise. And so he writes on the ground, speculatively it has been suggested, he wrote their names from the oldest to the youngest, and then says to her, the law says you should be stoned, where are your accusers? And then he says to her, go and sin no more. The wisdom said, kill her. Grace said, embrace her. So when you read Jesus' passion on his way to Calvary, the Bible says there were multitudes that followed him. And then a category there says, and the women. So who were these women? Jairus' daughter, a woman with the issue of blood, this girl that was healed, uh, saved, Mary Magdalene, and the women. So in any group, there are women, and then there are individuals. You have to decide who you is. I'm nearly there. I have 22 minutes. I can round this up. There are seven expressions of life. I want to get to number four. I'll give you all seven. Number one, the first expression of life is power. The challenge with individuals that have power they tend to abuse it and not use it for ideas of empowerment. Expression of life number two, love. Love is an entity which overlooks challenges but feeds the hope of life in a challenge. Job said, there is hope for a tree that is cut down. Just at the scent of water, Job 14, it comes alive. That's what love does. Love 
will cover a multitude of faults. Not condone it, but help you come out of your problem. For God so loved the world that he gave every drop of blood for every human being, including the Romans that brutalized him, abused him, and beat him to an inch of his life and had the audacity to crucify him. The second entity of life or expression of life is wisdom. You must ask God for wisdom every day. James 1 verse 1 to 7. If you lack it, ask for it. He gives to all men liberally. The challenge with wisdom is that every day you pray for wisdom, every day you will attract a challenge that you have to solve to prove you've been given wisdom. Number four, when you ask God for intelligence, it's divided into three categories, academic intelligence, environmental intelligence, and prophetic intelligence. I'll come back to prophetic intelligence towards my close. So there are some people who are blessed academically. Apostle Jimmy, I struggled in school. As a boy, I was put back in school three times in my life, three times. And on the 12th of September, 1969, when I just turned 12 in January, my mother, who was a Muslim, started reading the Bible and said, Tudor, pray for wisdom. The God of Solomon, a king in Israel, will give it to you. And from 1969 up until this morning, every day, I pray for wisdom. Every day. Just to be married to Chichi. I need a lot of wisdom. Baby, I hope you're watching me. I love you. Forgive me. Uh, number five, concrete knowledge. Not just knowledge. Concrete knowledge that is assured on solid foundations. And our concern for the 21st century in Africa, which has become the custodian of the gospel for the end time, south of the Sahara, Africans want to be in church. We want to serve the Lord. We are the greatest intercessors in history. Nigeria is the second largest uh, giver or donator of revenues behind the United States. Nigeria is number one in Africa. And others are catching up. Well, of course you have to be. You've got 200 million of you. And you still can't win a football cup. I don't get it, man. Do I have armor bearers to get me out? Concrete knowledge is important. We need government leaders, cabinet ministers who have concrete knowledge and not feathering their nest and, and drawing money for the people to themselves. Why, oh why would any person want several billion dollars in a Swiss account? whose interest alone can build schools, hospitals, universities, roads, great buildings. Why in the world would somebody do that? It's because fundamentals in concrete knowledge do not exist. The deeper the foundation, the taller the building. And so you have African leaders building countries on sand and not on rock. The same is true with churches. I'm taking too long with this. Number six, harmony. Harmony and unity are not the same. Harmony 
play a run in the key of C. Play some chords. One, four, five. Now add a few little pieces in there. That's harmony. Now, they are 88 notes. All of them complement each other. Just bang all of them. That's 88 notes in unity. It's not the same as harmony. And so we need harmony, togetherness, so we can function, which means a collaboration of worlds and their respective entities. And the last one of the seven expressions of life is devotion, which is spirituality. We need spiritual men and women who are afraid to sin and offend God who are afraid to speak words out of your mouth to hurt a brother, a sister, to speak curses upon individuals. We need spirituality that if you are not healed in church, you don't go and find yourself an obia man, a traditional healer, a witch doctor, to grind bones, put some leaves, cook roots, and give you to drink. We need spiritual leaders where it's God only and God alone. I need a praise offering right there. So let me come now to prophetic intelligence. Sisters and brothers, for you to attain prophetic intelligence, you have to go through the route of suffering. If you don't suffer, you can't earn anything. There are seven reasons for suffering. Reason number one, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. So suffering teaches you obedience. Number two, suffering brings true revelation. I was given a thorn in the flesh because of an abundance of revelation, God said, your suffering is needful. I'll substitute it with grace. Reason number three, suffering is important because suffering helps you with balanced prosperity. People that are very prosperous that don't have balance will be foolish. The more money you have, the more generous you have to be. The more revelation knowledge you have, the more you have to share and spread it around. Are you still tracking with the brother? I'm nearly there. True deliverance, number four. True deliverance, Exodus chapter number three and verse seven is a benefit of suffering. Sometimes God will allow 430 years of absolute pain under such austere, cruel leaders who don't have any value for human life. But in the midst of 430 years, God is able to give a woman a third child and put him in a river now, float down to Pharaoh's palace, and his wife, his daughter or sister, finds the baby in a basket, draws him out of the water, and calls him Moses, which means drawn out of the water. Everything God does in the world begins with water. 
When a woman is pregnant, that baby swims in a swimming pool for nine months. When God made the earth, the earth was birthed in water and the Holy Spirit put the seed of creation in the womb of that water. The human body is two-thirds water. So sisters and brothers, it's no coincidence Moses found his wife at a water well. Rebecca was found at a water well. Rachel was found at a water well. Can I preach on like I feel it? Amen. David got his weapons to kill Goliath from a stream. There were stones everywhere, but he went for the weapons of warfare that are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Jesus had to go down in the water to fulfill all righteousness. Sisters and brothers, as I come to my conclusion, prophecy is generated by the spirit of water because water is like the Holy Ghost. It's never stable. It moves here and moves there. Creates a wave there and a wave here. There's prophecy in your life because the word of the Lord Jesus Christ is prophecy. Slap a neighbor a high five and say destiny is in your life. Come on, say it with passion. And so then, when God leads you like Joseph and they throw you into a well, the well was dry. The reason the well was dry, it was a reflection of the emptiness of his brother's lives. The reason his brothers hated him was because their mothers, Leah, Bella, and Zilla, hated Rachel because Jacob spent his nights with the love of his life, Rachel. And they talked about Rachel in front of their sons and mothers define the future of their children and the boys hated Joseph because of what the mother said and when Jacob gave him a coat of many colors it made them even more mad Jacob could see the rivers of living water flowing out of Joseph's spirit but couldn't define it. Joseph was not a well. He was rivers of living water. That's why he had to go to the river Nile because the Nile was bigger than Jordan. The Nile could match what was flowing in him. Turn to your neighbor and say there's rivers coming out of your life. Rivers are flowing out of your life. Give God a place for a tsunami. And so when Joseph was born in 29 of Genesis, his father saw there was favor on his life. It's hard to hide favor. You can't hide favor. Yeah, I said you can't hide favor. When God puts favor on a person, you can try to hide it in a well. Ishmaelites, who were Abraham's mistake with Hagar, God used a mistake and provide transportation for favor to his destiny. If you've ever made a mistake, 
God has a way of rearranging that mistake to where it becomes a blessing for destiny in someone's life. And when he got to Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife was used to put him in prison because he had so much favor in Potiphar's house. And when he got to jail, the jailers saw there was favor on his life. Shout to a neighbor, you can't hide favor. He removed the rats. He removed the lice. He removed the fleas. He was put in the political portion of the prison and was given three and a half years of university training in political science. And one day, when two men who had Pharaoh's ear came to prison, Joseph went back to his etymology where he began and his coat of many colors in his spirit began to show up and he prophesied to them and said don't forget me tell three people when you make your money don't forget me don't forget me don't forget me I said don't forget me when God raises you up don't forget me tell three women don't you dare forget me don't go to Dubai by yourself I feel like preaching now the prophetic word is coming on your life you've been through suffering and shame but God sent me to tell you he sent me to tell you it's all a power play put you in prison it's a power play someone's gonna talk to Pharaoh and say there's a man in jail that has the answer and Joseph was elevated and gave a national plan physical emotional infrastructural political he gave Pharaoh a plan and he built Egypt in seven years of plenty in every power play Abraham defeated five kings and saved Lot in a power play the Philistines were afraid of Isaac he was one family a nation feared him in a power play Laban was jealous of Jacob and had to get rid of him in a power play Pharaoh was afraid of Moses but Moses overcame him in a power play the walls of Jericho fell down when Joshua showed up in a power play that mountain came to Caleb because it belonged to him in a power play Hannah prayed a prayer and and Samuel Samuel was deep down inside and in a power play she found him there in a power play he anointed David in a power play David killed Goliath in a power play. David mobilized 400 men in a power play. David became king in a power play. He lifted Mephibosheth in a power play. Elijah called fire from heaven 
in a power play Elisha got a double portion Elijah called fire from heaven give a neighbor a high five and say it's a power play shout it's a power play shout it's a power play you might be born in Bethlehem and you might live in Nazareth you might be on the shores of Capernaum and you might choose ignorant men to be the foundation of your ministry but when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were in one place in one accord obeying the words of Jesus don't leave Jerusalem until you receive power from on high and they waited there for 10 days and when the day of Pentecost was fully come power not by might not by power but by the Spirit came upon them they said we ought to obey God rather than man Paul and Silas in a jail beaten and weeping because of the pain sang praises to God at midnight and the jail began to rock because it was a power play whoever you are and whatever you do get ready for a power play here comes Jesus here comes your angels here comes your anointing here comes your miracle here comes signs and wonders here comes your breakthrough here comes your rhema word here comes your building your house your bigger church here comes the promise of God but most of all here comes the prophecy that was spoken of you years ago shout three times it's a power play chains are falling in your power play walls are coming down in your power play Ahab and Jezebel your days are numbered dogs are gonna lick your blood it's a power play Herod you going to die for killing babies you going to die for killing James because it's a power play clap your hands for a power play Can you give me two more minutes? The humanity has created several power blocks. I've heard of white power. I've heard of black power. I've heard of green power. Solar power. Red power. And horse power. Power. I've heard of atomic power and nuclear power. I've heard of wind power, fossil fuel power, jet power, rocket power, political power, economic power, man power, demonic power, angelic 
power the power of curses the power of your words the power of your actions but there's one power that we all need it's the power of a mighty God who sits high and looks low the heaven is his throne the earth is his footstool he guides your steps he knows your way he'll direct your destiny shout three times father give me power Simeon in Samaria said to Peter and John I'll pay you for this power what will it cost me Peter said to Simon your money perish with this so if you want power with God live a holy life fast and pray give until you can't give serve like you've never served and power will find you fifty three minutes Galatians 4 verse 4 when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son you are here now because you need to be but you are still traveling to the fullness of time. Everything that you are to be, just keep on walking. You will get to the fullness of time. And when you get there, Like King Saul in 10 of 1 Samuel, you'll get to Rachel's sepulcher and they'll tell you your donkeys are found. The exercise was not to tell him your donkeys are found because Samuel told him your donkeys are found. You've got to go to Rachel's sepulcher because that's the place of favor. Favor is not the fullness of time because you have favor in your life. He said you will leave Rachel's sepulcher. You will come to Tabor. You will find three men, one carrying bread, one carrying goat meat, and one carrying a bottle of wine. Bread is revelation knowledge which God is adding to your life. Goat meat is for men who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They are not milk people. They are strong meat people. God's going to give you strong meat, strong theology, strong doctrine, strong organizational, structural systems and strategy. And wine, you are going to be led by the spirit in a way that's 10 times, 20 times greater than your late dad. 
And the third thing, you are going to get to Bethel. Not just Bethel, but the hill at the house of Bethel, where a company of prophets are coming down. They are playing seven instruments, which are seven dimensions that God is going to impart into your life. And when God adds this company to you in Lagos, Nigeria, West Africa, Europe, America, when this company with their complete orchestration come in your life, you will know your full destiny and you will become another man. Another man. Another man. Another man. There is so much money coming to you. God's holding it back. The greatest enemy of faith is money. The second greatest enemy of faith is talent. Where's my little sister wearing yellow that was singing? Where are you? Is that peace? Are you wearing yellow? Stand right there. Your problem is you're too talented. You don't need faith to sing. You just use your gift. Now, I can't sing. And so I need faith to sing. And so your greatest enemy is talent. What you need to grow in your life is an ear and sensitivity. David could sing, but David had an ear for God's heart. I pray for you that you'd be a faith giant. Back to your leader. The reason God is holding back the money is because you will do so much with the arm of flesh. Jeremiah says, cursed is the man who leans on the arm of flesh. God wants you to trust him because without faith it is impossible to please God. And when you get to that level of faith, the kind of money and resource and gifted people that will come to you is stunning. And as for you, a prophet of the highest order, like chapter number 12, like chapter number 11 of Numbers, you are on the lowest level of the prophetic rung there which is Miriam. You have power to recognize the gift of Moses in a basket on a river. The power to place him in his mother's house from Pharaoh's daughter's hand. The power to pray for him for 80 years, 40 years in the wilderness, Iowa, 40 years with Pharaoh, learned in all the knowledge of Egypt in 7, verse 22 of Acts, and then learned in all the knowledge of Jethro, the head of state in Midian. And when she was 92 years old, out of a burning bush, a voice pulled Moses back. This woman, prayed for her brother for 92 years. That's your power. 
You are the angel room. And God is going to match you with a man that will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. You are not marrying a truck driver. <laughs> You're marrying somebody very high up in the political world. And you, like Esther, will begin to influence policy. Please celebrate the gift of God in Bishop Tudor Bismarck. I am so thankful. God is an intentional God and he has sent everyone here for us as a church for such a time as this. May the oil in your life never run dry, Bishop. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord will continue to uphold you by his righteous hand. In the name of Jesus, he will send men to hold your hand up. In the name of Jesus, Sir, you will never be without help. In the name of Jesus, every seed you have sown as you have sown of your life, you have sown of your anointing, your ministry, your gift, your energy, you have poured into the lives of people. Your children's children will never be without help. In the name of Jesus, as he said to David, because you have done this thing, your children will, children will always sit on the throne where I will chastise other people and take the throne away from them. Because they come from you, because they are of their seed, I will never take the throne away from them. So shall it be for your generations to come in the name of Jesus. Your children's children are blessed. The grace upon your life grows down to your children's children. The Bible says the oil flew from the head of Aaron down to his beard. Your children's children will reap of the benefits of the grace on your life. In the name of Jesus, the anointing that you will will impact and will continue to impact nations in the name of Jesus. We thank God that the heavens continue to open to you and like Samuel, not one word you speak will ever fall to the ground in the name of Jesus. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, it has not entered into the hearts of man what God will do and do through you. Where others say that there is a casting down, 
you will always say there is a lifting up in the name of Jesus the, sun, the light of your life will continue to shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter in the name of Jesus uh, you know it was was it Caleb that said give me this mountain I hear it very, I see it very clearly, sir. He says in his 80s, he said, I am still as powerful as I was in my, you said, give me this mountain. Sir, greater works. Greater works. This is just the beginning. Please appreciate the gift of God in Bishop Tudor Bismarck. God bless you, sir. We love you, we honor you, Fountain of Life. Please celebrate this gift. Still doing it, still doing it.